Welcome to Polychromatic Dimensions. I'm your host, Hideko Mills, and today we have Dolores Catherino. We haven't had a chance to really chat for some weeks now, and I have to say it's been kind of challenging being indoors for several weeks, and it's just great to see you, you know, oh, again. Too. And, yeah, and I know you've been busy over the last few weeks. You had received your Lumitone. And I'm sure you're having a good time with it. So why don't you give us an overview of how you've been spending the last few weeks? I received the Lumitone, oh, I think it was maybe three or four weeks ago. Mm -hmm. It's a prototype model. So it was one of the two that was at NAMM. It's just amazing. We've kind of been working through some firmware troubleshooting uh -huh. and making sure to get it optimized before it goes into mass production. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it'll probably be around the fall that they will start producing. So it looks like this year. It's just been such a great learning experience. The instrument is more different than I expected from all the other instruments I've been working with. I see. So how much different is it from, let's say, your standard keyboard? All of the keyboards that I've had before this one all still use that same pattern of black keys or a designation of those accidental notes, the sharp and flat notes on a piano. Mm -hmm. And this key, it's all white keys. So there's no designation of a chromatic system superimposed on it. Mm -hmm. And so when I first looked at the instrument, the first place that I went was, let's try the polychromatic system without accidentals. So you don't even have to worry about key signatures anymore. Mm -hmm. So Initially, I'd look at the keyboard as, okay, let's start with a home row, which would be a white color, mm -hmm. just like the white keys on a piano. Sure. And then instead of thinking of C sharp or C flat, what you do is you have the pitch colors of C going red to violet. And it made it much, much easier to write out because everything is in the so-called key of C because you're not using any of those... Um, black note accidentals. So in one way, it's much simpler, but also it allows you to have a far greater pitch palette. So with the Lumitome, you can have 55 notes per octave, and yet everything is in the key of C, where you're using the pitch colors to designate all these varying shades of flat and sharp. I see. So bear with my ignorance in terms of pitch color. So if the keys are all white and, you know, I'm coming from being a guitarist, right? So I'm not necessarily visualizing the way a keyboardist would on a normal keyboard. But how would you communicate, for example, that if it's going to be played in the key of C, let's say I wanted to, as a guitarist, go to a chord that is an E-based chord, you know, let's say E major or E minor. Mm -hmm. How would you execute those that same pitch through the Lumitone? So right in the center, we have a white row. Yep. And then, um, so if you start on the notes E, mm -hmm. and you just think of the colors going up, red, orange, yellow, white, cyan, blue, violet, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. um, then what you're thinking is, okay, I'm going to play my E. I'm going to go to the G. Now, if I want it to be sharp, I'll be going up toward violet the colors up toward violet. Uh -huh. And if I want to go flat, I'll go on that G note, I'll go down toward red. Uh -huh. But you have multiple options so that you can dial in those intervals to get these really cool resonant effects and these kind of phase pulsations. I see. So from, from a sound module standpoint, is it the same sounds that you're using on your microzone keyboard? Yeah, actually, I, I used the same setup because it took so long to get a working setup that wouldn't crash mm -hmm. that I wanted to just leave that constant and focus all of my time on the controller and actually practicing the instrument, figuring out how the scales lay out, how to start composing with it. And it's I don't know if it's this way for other people that deal with technology, but you really can end up spending so much time troubleshooting and trying to implement very complex configurations mm -hmm. at the expense of your practice time on the actual instrument. And so for me as an instrumentalist, I really am more focused on, I really want to get more technique on the instrument. I want to 
uh, work on composition. So at this point, unless I had uh, somebody, a group or people to collaborate with on that technical end, I just, it's, it's a time choice of, of how you devote your time. So in a nutshell, I, I just use the same setup that I've been using with the Microzone so that I can focus on just troubleshooting the Lumitone firmware and practicing so I can figure out how to get some technique on the instrument. Sure. There was a time back in the day in terms of playing with other musicians or, you know, touring with a band or an artist, you know, for, as a guitar player, all I had to worry about, it was changing my strings, you know, every couple of shows or so. Right. And that was right. in trying to keep my instrument clean. And every few months or so I'd have to take a look at my frets, but I would always sort of outsource that kind of maintenance outside of just changing my strings. When you were talking about the guitar and how easy it was in the past before all the software technology. Sure. I was thinking of that intermediate stage where you go from that to hardware units. So you had uh, your hardware effects pedals uh, before MIDI. So it's really, right. you know, I still have my hardware sound modules because even though as limited as they are by today's standards, mm -hmm. you turn them on, they work. Yes. They are, you know, and, and that's something that, with software and technology and updates mm -hmm. that you can't rely on at a hundred percent. And sometimes when I'm practicing, the whole system crashes. Oh, that must be frustrating. And you know, that's my biggest fear about ever trying to perform this kind of music live is you know, until you have that kind of reliability that you would have say with your guitar and your effects pedals and your amplifier, mm -hmm. then it's just too stressful to think that the whole system could crash while you're on a stage with all these people that, came to see it so oh sure yeah and to even bring it to geekier terms it's like the difference between the comfort of having a dial tone on your telephone from analog phone service to going to voice over ip technology which um, it's getting better but you know often in technology we'll say it has to be as good as dial tone so yes, it has to be good as as good as foot pedals that you know, <laughs> you know yes. that work. It, it's right. on or off, right? But it seems as though you have to not only understand how to uh, play an instrument and learn a new type of instrument, but you've got to learn how to troubleshoot all of the technical challenges that come with trying to interface sounds through the keyboard or having the keyboard communicate with, say, your computer system. So I can see why that could be really frustrating for you, just in terms of having to deal with those glitches and those software crashes and so forth, which takes you away from composition. So let's talk a little bit more about the composition part of it. Have you had to adjust how you think about this instrument compared to say how you think about the microzone? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does do microtones. Yes. Um, well, it, it really is almost like a different language, but because I've played so many different instruments, I'm used to switching modes a little bit easier. Yeah. So in some sense, it's much more like the way you would approach a guitar in terms of chord shapes and scale shapes. Mm -hmm. So I'm really paying attention to how the notes of each scale lay out shape wise on the keyboard. Mm -hmm. And that's how I'm developing my technique. But then on the other hand, it's also a keyboard style technique in the sense of you're spending some time actually paying attention to each note that you're playing mm -hmm. so that you um, do that cognitive. It's very exhausting. It's usually the first thing I do. Mm -hmm. So I'm going through the scales and I'm, I'm actually saying what note it is, looking where it is on the keyboard. So I'm aware of what the notes are. And then after that, it's, it's more intuitive and, and easier, at least for me, to focus more on the visual shapes and how shapes feel in your hands. That was the biggest lesson of the guitar, of how scale shapes feel in your hands mm -hmm. and how some... Uh, some positions of, of scales are much more comfortable mm -hmm. and other ones are more challenging, but yet it's still, say, an A major scale. Sure. It's just which position, where are you playing it on the neck and how does it lay out? So it's been a nice way of kind of importing all of my prior experience with different instruments towards sure. something that's totally new. 
Sure. So you're one of those scary human beings uh, that can play many instruments uh, well. Um, and, you know, there have been a handful of artists through the years that have made it uh, commercially. Uh, they became commercial successes by, uh, for example, composing uh, an entire album. And I say album because I come from that <laughs> era <laughs> where, you know, for example, an artist like Prince was, uh, he would be able to play guitar, bass, keys, drums, whatever uh, uh, instrument he was able to execute. And I think his fir first album was basically, uh, he played all of the instruments. And I wonder sometimes if you had the opportunity to compose beyond, uh, say, the keys, because I do know that you play all kinds of instruments, um, how would you make that mental adjustment, you know, from, uh, say, the Lumitone and going back to a fretless bass to a soprano sax? I mean, how does your brain kind of go from one instrument and the intricacies, you know, say, of the Lumitone to uh, not that soprano sax isn't intric intricate, but I mean, I would imagine you're using different parts of your brain for that. Yeah, I guess the way that I think about it at this point is that I'm really trying to internalize these different pitches, these these micro pitches so that I can hear them and distinguish them so that I can take that back to a fretless bass or vocal mm -hmm. as a vocalist, just try to really be able to work on the technique to, you know, replicate those pitches and mm -hmm. gain technique in that. And it's, um, I hope I have time to do it in this lifetime because just working at this very basic foundational level with the keyboard uh, is, it's all encompassing. I, you know, I could spend the rest of my life just on the Lumitone. My and, but I think that maybe my purpose is more to uh, look at these different innovative instruments and see how we can create a system that's intuitive and takes less of the difficulty out of moving into the realm of 55 notes per octave or 100 notes per octave, anywhere you want to go. And just you have a system to just transition right on over from all of the prior musical experiences you've had mm -hmm. with the chromatic system. I see. So are you able to get to a point, at least with the Lumitone, where you're comfortable enough to collaborate with, say, another human using another instrument? Or are you still in that sort of test mode, research mode? Well, that's the goal for um, the composition I'm working on now. Okay. I do have some wonderful musician friends. One is a microtonal flutist, okay. and the other is a jazz trumpet player. Very mm -hmm. phenomenal musicians. And they've also had experience with playing micro pitch music. So that is the goal for this one. Um, we'll see if we can kind of do it virtually sure. um, in the kind of situation that we're in right now. Um, but that has always been a goal. And I tried just in a very shallow fashion uh, or superficial fashion to figure out how to do the vocals. Um, and it's a lot more difficult than I thought it would be. So I guess that might be a musical kind of not diversion, but a different area to start working on is actually practicing vocal technique so that I can um, sing these different pitches and actually sure. hear them and know what I want to sing. Because you can kind of sing in the old chromatic system. It's, I guess you'd call it backward compatible. Mm. So you can just use a chromatic system with the polychromatic system underneath it, say in a keyboard. I guess I'm trying to approach it from the other way where I'm really trying to start from the, the harmonic foundation upward. So instead of trying to just superimpose some kind of chromatic melody on a polychromatic system, I'm trying to understand the system and then create melodies that just sound so otherworldly because mm. you wouldn't even think to approach the melody that way from a chromatic system. Gotcha. Yeah. So I'm trying to visualize how, uh, how this would work. So, you know, in terms of working with vocalists in the past for me, it's been, uh, I've always been really excited to work with those vocalists that really sing around 
you know, what might be an obvious melody. And the same with instrumentalists, where an instrumentalist could sort of uh, riff around what might be a typical or a more linear kind of musical message. It'll be interesting to see how you're able to do that with uh, the Lumitone. I know you can do it with the other instruments, but it'll be interesting to see how that works with the Lumitone. You know, I when I listen to the Microzone, it's always been sort of a uh, situation where I can hear even phasing happening between, you know, the chord structures that you put together. And so it'll be interesting to know if, uh, from a vocalization standpoint, how does one use a uh, their voice to sort of work within those chord structures that are phasing in and out. And again, bear with me, Dolores, because I'm, you know, I'm still stuck thinking about the 12 note, you know, the 12 note spectrum. I was just thinking that uh, what you were saying m makes it a little bit more clear of kind of the philosophy of how I'm approaching this problem. And that is that usually the way that we listen to micro pitch music is from a chromatic perspective. Right. So you listen to it, you say, oh, it sounds out of tune. It, mm -hmm. it sounds like, yeah, regular music, but it's out of tune. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to do is shift that perspective where your ear gets so used to all of these micro pitches mm -hmm. that when you're listening to chromatic music, you're saying, that's so coarse. There are so many more pitches and everybody's using the same 12, and yeah. where's all the variance? And then from that point, when you start to listen again to micro pitch music, you're able to hear it on its own terms sure. instead of trying to force it into the chromatic framework and say, it doesn't fit, it's off, it's out of tune. Sure. And hopefully that's kind of the larger philosophy and how um, it can change the way that we appreciate music. I really appreciate that perspective because I uh, have not really thought about approaching it that way. The only thing that I could sort of identify with is, you know, years ago, playing a, uh, a nylon string guitar, for example. And if the frets weren't polished properly, I could tell, you know, if you're hitting an octave, a note, an octave away, and the frets are not properly aligned. I could hear that fraction of a difference in the note, right? And I remember saying that this something's not right on this guitar. It might maybe the neck needs adjustments, and and turned out that I think there was an old jazz guy that said, "Oh no, man, she's right." <laughs> you know, in order for me to get some validation that my ear was, you know, my ear was uh, picking up something's not right. But it didn't occur to me to to think about it in the other uh, sort of backwards, as, as you were saying, right? Instead of me just uh, hearing something and just assuming that it might be out of pitch or out of tune, may, you know, maybe not, maybe it's intentional. And, and to be open and embrace that difference, right? <clears throat> from, yes. from, your, from compositions that you're working on. And just the idea that you were able to discriminate that level of pitch precision, you had that much pitch precision to notice that. And really the shift of per perspective is just to say, yes, it doesn't equal an octave as I hear it in right. 12 tone equal temperament, but that other pitch does have its own value. It's really got a different sound, a different pull when right. it's playing in different chords. And so that's the shift. Yeah. I guess the other similarity would be when guitarists will pull a string, you know, to go from one step to a half step or one step to a whole step based on the pull of the string. And if you don't pull the string uh, to the precise half step mark, you know, it's still cool. Yes. <laughs> you know, it still sounds good. And it still, still sounds uh, humanly executed, I should say. Yes, because we don't speak in equal temperament. So when you yeah. think of an instrument as really trying to be a voice, mm -hmm. and it's like, why are we locked into this thing? It'd be almost like trying to speak through auto-tune. Right. And how much expression would you lose if you couldn't get all the inflections in between the notes? Right, exactly. I re recall uh, hearing a story about how uh, deaf people, when they're signing, for example, Signing is far more expressive 
in terms of communicating emotion than say vocal vocalization right and it didn't occur to me that for them it is a much broader experience and it's really expressive versus you know my monotone uh, words <laughs> where i might say hey man i'm angry right and they're actually communicating far more powerfully how angry and emotional it is through their instruments, their hands, their facial expressions. But then think about us as instrumentalists, as uh -huh. musicians, and a level, that's really something you strive for after you kind of master your, your rudimentary level of technique. You really want to have that ability to just express so much emotion through the inflection of the tones on your instrument and your choice of tones, your phrases. That's where the artistry comes in after you master your technique. Right, right. So I'm really looking forward to listening to your compositions after having spent time with the Lumitone. So at this point, I know you've got a lot more work to get back to in terms of getting your compositions underway. I really hope that some of the technical challenges will uh, subside, you know. But you did say something to me that I thought was interesting about the Lumitone being customizable. So, you know, again, I go back to how can I relate to that? And I remember there was a time from playing an acoustic guitar to an electric guitar and the introduction of MIDI technology, right, where you could have a guitar note actually execute a different sound. You know, it could actually execute a saxophone pitch or something along those lines. And so that's the closest thing I can identify with when you tell me about customization with the Lumitone. Would you say more about what you mean by that? What I was really thinking about as I started working with the instrument, like I said, with those kind of, it's a blank slate. All the keys look the same, exactly. And then I didn't realize how confining other keyboards were, even the innovative keyboards that I've worked with, the Continuum, the Seaboard, the Tonal Plexus, and the Microzone, they all have the superimposition of those black notes in their design. So you're locked into kind of that a chromatic approach. So initially when I was approaching polychromatic music, I was taking each one of those notes, the white notes and the black notes, and giving them pitch color. But now with the Lumitone, what you see is that you really don't even need the black notes anymore because you can just have those white notes on the piano and then you have the subdivisions just on each one of those notes, A through G. And you're able to create minor chords, major chords, dominant chords, and all the variants that are in between. And the, you don't have to worry about key signatures anymore. And you don't, that was one problem with the um, tonal plexus and the microzone was when I would shift columns, I'd be going from say the key of B flat to which has two flats. And then you go to the key of B natural, which is all sharps. And so it was just a nightmare to try to notate and standard notation. But now if we get rid of the flats and sharps and all of those kind of pitch modifier symbols, then it's just a matter of me putting in a different color on each note. A through G. And so that's what I mean in, in terms of its flexibility. It really is a blank slate because it's the first keyboard that I've worked with that doesn't have that super imposed piano chromatic layout with white and black um, kind of keys or regions on the instrument. Sure. And so the amount of time that you're spending working with the Lumitone, let's presume that we humans can actually go out and about again outside, <laughs> you know, even a year or 18 months from now. And if they were to invite you to NAM, and let's say they would like you to essentially demonstrate what you've discovered with the Lumitone, would that be something that would you would be comfortable with? Well, I think it, what it makes me think of more is the uh, AES meeting, the Audio mm -hmm. Engineering Society meeting in a sense that NAM was so noisy that yes. you really would have to have an isolated room, maybe also demoing um, immersive audio with sure. the speakers. And then you have kind of a quiet environment where you can really appreciate not only the micro pitch and the pitch color, but also how it moves in the room when you have an immersive audio setup. Sure. So I think that would be an optimal demonstration of it. And those kind of 
immersive audio and separate room demonstrations happen more at the AES meeting I see. than they do at NAM. Sure. So, and you know, NAM is about selling merchandise mm -hmm. and AES is about research and next generation stuff. So I don't know if there will be some kind of a, if NAM will start to move in that direction or there's going to be some kind of a hybrid where you have all the AES experimentation and audio and then innovative musical instruments and somehow there is some kind of conference or, or meeting to actually demonstrate what the combination of these technologies can do. Boy, that would be really exciting. And maybe there's an in-between step where you can have a composition on, let's say, YouTube and just have folks listen through their headsets just to get a better feel for what it is that, you know, your composition, but also in an environment where there's focus, right? There's yes. no external noise distractions. And it seems like NAM is antithetical to that because that, that, that was so the thing cool. that really wore me down over the days was just the sound level was so constant and high that yeah. it just really, uh, you know, it's, it's like listening, you know, when you were mixing, how they talk yeah. about your ears just get fatigued. Oh, sure. And after a while, I just had to put in earplugs because mm -hmm. it was just constant sound from every direction and high volume, relatively speaking. Right. Um, that it just is not an environment that's conducive to um, that level of listening. Sure. And so perhaps at one of our next podcasts, we can sort of dive into a composition and allow folks to sort of put on their headsets and listen to what you've got for us. Yes. What do you think? That's great. Yeah. Well, Dolores, thank you so much for spending some more time talking about your journey. And honestly, I'm looking forward to hearing what you've got going after spending some time with the Lumitone. And I'm hoping that you get a chance to virtually see some other uh, colleagues and, and collaborate virtually with other musician colleagues. But I want to thank you again for spending some time with me today. So thank you, Dolores. Stay safe and stay healthy and have a great day. This is Hideko Mills with Polychromatic Dimensions. Mm -hmm.